I love your podcast. This is the oldest word set. Bill and Dave, welcome to the Bits of Gold podcast. It's awesome to have you on today. Thanks for having us, Danny. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, yeah, very excited. So just before we jump in, uh, maybe you could tell tell us a little bit about who you are and how you came about working together. Uh, this is Dave uh, of the Dave and Bill Show. We're pretty interchangeable, but the faster talking guy, that's Dave. Um, <laughs> and we met, I mean, I can hardly remember a bajillion years ago. You know, we knew each other in business a couple of different times. Uh, Bill, a million years ago, uh, was in business with the younger brother of one of my former college roommates um, and an old friend. I think we met first that way, and then we collaborated a time or two. And when he was running a design firm every now and then, I would drop in. So we've known each other for over a dozen years, and I had uh, been doing you know, high-tech stuff and freelance consulting for 25 years. I was a gainfully unemployed marketing guy for a long time. And then um, I got invited to teach a class at Cal Berkeley around 1999 which was the predecessor of designing your life. And then Bill got this new cool job, you know, decided a, a brilliant thing to do is take a 50% cut and pay and become a teacher. And, and I said, Hey, let's do this thing. And that was 2007 and the rest is history. Amazing. Um, so your, your book, designing your life, how to build a well-lived joyful life. I'm super excited to have you on to discuss a little bit about what's in the book, because I too believe we all have agency to build and design our life. And I applaud the work that you've done and ha- continue to do in this space because I believe so many people are living some form of default rather than by design. Um, before we, we jump in, maybe you could just share a little bit about, about what it means to design your life. Yeah, sure. I'll take this one. This is Bill. Um, you know, when Dave and I got together in 2007, uh, he told me about the class he was doing over at Berkeley. I said, that's great, but we're going to, if we do it at Stanford, it's got to be design based because, you know, when all you got is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And all I know how to do is design stuff. I was at Apple for seven years. I did you know, my own consulting firm. I did a bunch of other things. So the first time I was a full-time academic in 2006, 2007, we got together. And it seemed like you know, I've been teaching my students for a long time how to design new to the world things. You know, what, what's an iPhone? We don't know. Let's go build a bunch of stuff and, and figure it out. You know, what, what's, when I was at Apple, we were doing the first laptops. So this idea of building your way forward, experimenting into the future when you can't get any data, you know, if you're doing something brand new, is what we teach. We call it design thinking now or human centered design in the old days. It seemed pretty obvious to me that the future of my life isn't new to the world thing. I can't get a whole lot of data about it. I mean, I can get a little bit of data. I probably will do similar things to what I'm already doing. But a lot of times people are they're bored or they're stuck or they just don't know what they want. And then, and then they don't have any tools to move forward. So design is a perfect way of moving forward because the future of your life is a design. Like you say, you have agency. And you're right. I think a lot of people, a lot of people when they show up at one of our workshops or we talk to them about you know, having read the book and what was the impact, they say, I was stuck. I was in this default mode. I was just stuck. And I read your stuff and I tried a couple of the exercises. And now, I, one, I don't feel stuck. And two, I feel kind of hopeful. Because because I, now I realize, hey, I can prototype anything. I can try stuff. I can I can, you know, engage my community of people that are all over, all around me, you know, radical collaboration. I can I can be curious. I don't need to know the answer. I can just be curious. And all these are mindsets, right, of, of designers. And we teach that stuff in the class. We teach it in the book. And it seems to be really useful for people. What So, you, you know, you mentioned being stuck. Um, a lot of people in my community tend to fall into two places. They either feel stuck and they want to make change but don't know where to start, or they fall victim of, of an abundance of opportunity. They have too many choices and don't know what to decide, where to focus, what they want to optimize for. How do you, how do you go about picking a direction? Okay, I'll, I'll take one of those. I'm, I'm going to do the FOMO to Jomo thing. So the, 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 um, the paradox of choice. I mean, so a guy named uh, Barry Schwartz at Swarthmore wrote a really good book called The Paradox of Choice. Um, we are overloaded with choice. Your brain can handle four to six alternatives. Over that, you completely choke. Um, There's a great study at Columbia about jams. If there's too many jams on the jam table, you just can't decide. And uh, so give your brain a break, And which means what you have to do, if you've got too many alternatives, you have to let a bunch go, full stop. you got to cut the list down. Oh, no, oh, God, what if I let the wrong one go? Well, here's the thing. You know, we're, we're coming from scarcity, 
If you're experiencing FOMO, fear of missing out, like, oh God, I have these alternatives and, you know, keep your options open. By the way, the council, keep your options open is a disaster. Um, what you really want to do is after you make a choice, deeply choose your choice, burn the boats, move forward, really <laughs> own your choice. Then and only then will you have a chance to actually be happy rather than wondering, God, I hope I did the right thing, which ruins it. Um, and if you're a good designer and you're attentive, you know lots of alternatives will come to you in the future. You're not worried about new options. That's not a problem at all. And what you really got to get to is JOMO, the joy of missing out, because you realize, number one, each of us contains more aliveness than one lifetime permits us to live, i.e. there's more than one of you in there. And number two, the world is an incredibly huge place. So you're an amazingly capacious entity that's way bigger than your lifetime. And the world is a way bigger place than you can possibly get your hands around. Isn't that great? Where every time you see something go by, you go, well, thank God. I know that there's more in me than I have time to even pay attention to. And there's more in the world that I'm going to get to. It's such a lovely reminder to see that fascinating thing float by that I'm never going to get to go do. I just love the joy of missing out. So the reframe is, by the way, if you're not experiencing FOMO, you're not paying attention. Of course, there's something you're missing out. My God, you're just, come on. It's not a problem. It's about getting more out of life, not cramming more into it. So, you know, make good choices and then enjoy them. But instead of, if you don't have that problem, you have like, I don't even know how to start at all. Well, Bill can fix that for you. Yeah, I mean, and a lot of people, you know, we are in a world with lots and lots of choices and you can, you know, and you're pretty sure that if you just spent 10 more minutes on Google, you could find five more, you know, options. But assuming you're stuck and you don't even you don't have a way forward, you, you, you know, you're 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 frozen. And a lot of people we meet that are, are that way. I mean, and they report themselves as being kind of numb. You know, and 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 they're spending time doom scrolling on Twitter or, or Instagram mm. or whatever. And they're kind of lost in this digital world. And there's a lot of stimulation. Right. You can just get. Yeah, ab absolutely. Stimulate. But there's no <clears throat> there's no call to action. There's no there's no framework for it. And so using a designer's mindset, so designers have you know, five basic mindsets we, we teach the D school, curiosity, like you're, aren't you curious about something? I mean, even if you even if you report yourself as stuck or numb, huh, this AI mm. stuff, I've been reading, doing a little reading in that, that's kind of interesting. Or uh, fiber arts, I didn't even know that was a thing, but I saw this amazing exhibit. Oh, I live right across the street from the M Museum of Craft and Design here in the Dog Patch in San Francisco. Fiber arts, wow, I wonder what that's all about. And just find, you know, curiosity. Radical collaboration, because the answer is in the world. It's out in the world with other people. That's where you're, you're not going to think your way to a solution. You're going you're gonna to get with people and talk and talk and talk and talk and, talk and try stuff. Radical collaboration, um, Mindful of process, because sometimes you're, you're, when you're stuck, you need to generate lots of ideas. But when you have lots of ideas, like David's saying, then you need to converge. You need to, you know, you need some selection criteria. You need to move forward and make good, you know, good decisions well. Um, you know, and then and and then a bias to action, because if you can't get any data about the future, what are you thinking about? I mean, what what does your pro con spreadsheet have in it? If you don't even mm. know what you want. Then a bias to action to start, you know, just engage your curiosity, radical collaboration, talking to people, mindful of process. You know, it, 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 once you learn these mindsets, it really does change the way you approach problems, including your life. Yeah, I know, I know in the book at some point, I don't know if it was towards the end, but you put, there's no right choice, only good choosing. And that really resonated with me. And I think that that can resonate with a lot of people. I think, uh, by the way, I will say, you know, your, your audience, I'm thinking particularly now, you know, we spend a lot of time with 18 to 35 year olds and, you know, Gen Z is up and running. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my baby's 35, my eldest is just about turned 42. So they, you know, they're managers in companies that have people working for them that are 23 and 20. And, um, and man, there is a there's another pandemic going on right now, and it's the agony of trying to be right. Oh God, is is this really the right thing? You know, whether it's the relationship or the job or the situation or the movie or the the sushi place. I mean, my God, there's got to be a right answer. I mean, people are really freaking out about getting it right. There is no right. Mm. There is no right answer. There are lots of good answers. There's no one exclusive best version of you or your life. There are lots of good ones, but I'm not absolutely sure. No, you're not. Certainty is not an option. 
you know, I mean, I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the theist, Bill's the atheist, but we're both quite convinced that a fair bit of faith is required to move forward. You know, I, I radically collaborate because I have some faith out there that the world is full of answers and people want to help me. And so there's an optimistic collaborative mindset, a growth mindset that says it's out there. Let's go get some cool stuff. And I'm going to come back and do it again tomorrow because I know it's not good enough, but it might be good enough for now. And if I know how to design, I'll just keep doing, redesigning until it gets better and better. Yeah, I think that's that's certainly a great mentality to have, and I think could take a, a lot of weight off someone's shoulders. How how would you recommend people navigate um, the whole weight of money versus the pursuit of meaning? Uh, money versus meaning. <laughs> One of our favorite false dichotomies. It's like work life balance. Oh, if I have more work, I have less life. Or if I have more money, I have less meaning. Every time we set up these false dichotomies, an A B situation. It's a lose-lose. <clears throat> and your brain automatically makes it a zero-sum game. So if I have money, I can't have meaning. If I have meaning, I can't have money. Or what's the best case you know, resolution of a false dichotomy? And eh, money and eh, meaning. You know, like average, average. It's not true. So whenever you, whenever you hear someone make a false dichotomy, you need to reframe it and you need to blow it up. And in this case, we reframe it because it's not true. The world is more complicated than that. And actually, people work for three things because we're all makers and we have a maker mix and it's a, it's a blend of a, of a kind of three things that make the song of your life, right? So um, like a mixing board on a, on, a, on a digital mixing board for music. So in, in the market economy, it's money. Absolutely, you gotta make, some, gotta make enough money to have safety and security. By the way, past that, all the research, and we're very research-based at the Stanford Lab, all the research says past having enough money for safety and security, money has no impact whatsoever on your happiness. And so, but in the market economy, we measure money. In the impact economy, or in the social economy, we measure impact. Like, I'm running this nonprofit, and we're keeping kids out of gangs because they're playing basketball after school. And and then when we do what our big a big a big assignment in the in the first book is the um, the Odysseys, three different versions of your life because it's never two, it's always three. So in the third version, in everybody's Odyssey. They all say, you know, I wish my I wish my life was a little more creative. I wish I had something in my life that was more creative. And in and what what in the in the uh, creative economy, people get paid with expression dollars. I got to I got to recite my poem at the open mic night. I got to play my song. I got to I got to perform my play. Mm. So it's not. Do, can I have money or meaning? It's money, impact, and expression. And when you take those three things and you move the sliders on your little mixing board, you don't jam every, you know, if you're making a good song, you don't jam everything to, to maximum volume, right? Yeah. It's a mix. You need a, you need a, I need yes. a little bit more expression in my life. I need a little bit more creativity and expression. I need a little bit more impact. Or, you know, impact's good. I'd like to get a little more money because that's, that's kind of making me nervous. When you have three things to, to, to um, optimize in this case or to, to mix, you blow up the whole money versus meaning problem. It, it's not a real problem. It's a bad framing. When you reframe to money expression um, and impact, all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute. Now I know what I want to do. And by the way, this notion, you know, particularly amongst the, the, this younger generation, that all of my good karma and meaning and purpose is going to come from my job those 40 hours a week thing I do. That's a yeah, really, the only thing that matters is what they're paying me for. That's a, that's a dead <laughs> end. Big time. But it's a really new idea that you know, not only is my job got to have to be perfect as a job, it's also going to, you know, be the most meaningful and impactful thing I do. There's your vocation Let's... and there's your avocation. You might do things for, on the market's terms, but you might not want to do your, the things you do for love and for passion. You might not want to do those on the market's terms. You might want to do this for some other reason. I'd love to talk a little bit about passion because that is, um, you know, that is something that we've all heard at some point in our life. I'm sure even, uh, you know, maybe early on in your in your life, oh, yeah. you were probably told, What's follow your passion. Your passion. Follow your passion. <laughs> Thankfully not. The, uh, no, it, we, we love to hate this idea. We're known as we're, we're getting a rep as the anti-passion guys, along with Cal Newport, by the way, um, a really good guy. Um, but nonetheless, we actually are not anti we are very pro-passion, but we're anti a massive dysfunctional belief about passion. So the question, what's your passion? You mm. know, and it um, uh, turns out eight out of 10 people, according to the research, answer the passion question one of two ways. 
gosh, Dave, I, I don't know. I haven't found mine yet. I, I sure hope I do. Um, or, hey, I got a couple. Which one do you want to hear about first? No, either of those totally normal human beings doesn't have a single life organizing passion. This is where you got to be immensely que- uh, careful with your questions. Questions have belief systems. And before you choose to authorize a question to judge or guide your life, you better vet its belief system. So you walk up to a 22 year old or an 18 year old or a 31 year old and you say, hey, Danny, what's your passion? You know, what's that question believe? Number one, everybody has a passion. Number two, you will know it early in life. Number three, before you've ever even done anything (laughs) in the world with it, there's going to be a place for you. Number four, you can make a living at it. And if you went to the Stanford Business School, like the 56 alums I talked to yesterday, they think you should be able to make a killing at it. Um, And guess what? Eh, None of those is true. Not one. What's what's the better question to ask yourself? Well, what do you what, what do you find interesting in the world? What keeps you up a little bit at night? Who what would you like to learn more about? Where would you like to lean in? If there was a party that would invite you, where would you like to go? So there are lots of different ways to do it. Passion, by the way, is very often the outcome of the well lived life, not the starting place. Mm, I if love you don't that. have a life organizing passion, or you have one you can't make a living at, that's fine. Now let's start getting your maker mix lined up and figured out, and off you go. Don't forget, we're growth-oriented guys. If you're going to, I'm 69 freaking years old. I've got 11 grandchildren, you know. I buried my my wife two years ago, but I'm in a new relationship now because I believe in growth. And, you know, if you're going to get better, you were worse. You don't have to get it all done now. So Mm. it's like not, you know, I mean, finishing each day with a little longing left in your soul just means tomorrow might be a little on the interesting side. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's certainly interesting to hear. I think if you ask me what my passion is, it, it would just lead me to nowhere because I'm passionate about so many things. Right. Right. And <laughs> Hey, we're all in favor. Of, we're all in favor of living and working passionately, you know, invest, invest mm. in the things you do. And as Dave said, the research says that, you know, you don't necessarily know whether, you know, teaching English in high school or running, you know, uh, a nonprofit, you know, for kids after school. You don't really know which of those is the thing. But as you get into something and if you're good at listening to yourself and listening to your heart and listening to your head, you know, emotional intelligence plus in, in, you know, IQ plus EQ, very important in making decisions. You may find yourself drawn towards certain things which eventually do become a passion, you know, a mission or something like that. But just don't start with that. I mean, don't start with that question because it makes, here's a problem. And this is a problem with most self-help stuff, which is not research-based. Oh, I read the book and it said there's a secret and I tried it and it didn't work for me. So I must be bad, lame, horrible, you know, whatever. No one has ever, and and because the belief system is everybody else read the book and they all got better. Mm. And so now not only did reading the book not make me better, it harmed me because I now think, oh, I guess I'm the only person of the five million people who bought this book who didn't find the secret to his life or whatever. And it's just it's just bad stuff. Let, let me illustrate this. For, there's, a, there's a story, Bill, and a, a former student of ours. He'll, he'll know quickly what I'm talking about. We'll, we'll call her Sarah. Um, and I'll change the story a little bit, but not much, you know, and she takes a class. She's a lovely, energetic woman, really bright, does her odyssey plan, has three completely different versions of life. Actually has five. Um, and she says, you know, I'm, so I'm really going to go out there and kill it, you know, and she realized, oh yeah, you know, uh, as Bill and Dave told me, you know, neurophysiology tells us we don't even fully form our neocortex until we're 28, a little later in men. There's a surprise. Um, and, you know, so I've got a couple of years to go here yet. I'm just trying to configure my adult self to have some wonderful choices and off she goes to implement a couple of years worth of each of three very different ways of being in the world. And she's killing it, by the way, you know, yeah. and so she's back in town. She's going through. She wants to have office hours. You know, she sits down and she's just coming back from I think she's like five or seven years out of school now. Um, and she has just killed it. You know, I mean, she she did this incubator thing and she did this foreign investing thing and she was over in Asia and she's, you know, and everything went great. She killed every one of them and she's depressed. And she goes, I, 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 you know, I, just, I thought something was going to work. I go, well, Sarah, it sounds like everything worked. She goes, well, I mean, it went fine. I go, what's the problem? She goes, I, I don't know. I just don't know what to do. And I said, oh, I see what we got here. Every, every single one of these went really, really well. And you really enjoyed it. Yeah. 
and you had a good time. Yeah. And there was a narrative that made sense that had a, you know, a, a life view, a worldview and an individual personal work view and a sense of identity, which was lined up and made sense to you and was completely manageable. Right. Yeah. All three for three. And not one of them jumped up out of the cake, you know, with sparkles on and kissed your big wet on the lips and goes, it's me. It's me. It's me. I'm your life. I'm your job. Charming. She goes, no, I really wanted that. I go, guess what? Not going to happen. Because you know what you are? You're an interested person. You're an incredibly talented person. You're not a one thing person. It's so good to be you. We're so freaking lucky to be Sarah. Because mm. guess what? You could choose to be anywhere. You could absolutely make anything work. That's a skill. The reframe is you're fine. Where where does that person go though? You know, if they've achieved it all, they're but they're 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 unhappy. Okay, they're unfulfilled. The way she achieved it all. What a stupid thing to say. I mean, <laughs> no, she hasn't achieved it all. She demonstrated the ability to participate in a variety of different locations. There's a lot to be done in each one of those. Go, pick a cool one, go back and get after it. Here's a, here's a piece of you know, there's a video we play in class. Come a, on, Danny. A video we play in class by a professor named Ruth Chang. I believe she's at Rutgers, and she talks about hey, when 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 choices are on a par. When, you know, I've got three things and they all went great. I could do any one of the three things. When choices are real, literally on a par, then what you do is you have agency to choose. You choose into the life of the project manager at a big company like Google. You choose. You anything. choose the choosing. Mm. So when and when you put your agency <laughs> choice, I stand for, she says, I stand for chocolate donuts. I stand for living in you know rural the rural world, not the city world, or I stand for, you know, the urban, you know, warrior. When you you get you get it when particularly when you have, you know, skills and you can do lots of different things, and most people can really do more than they think, you get to author your life by mm. exercising your agency and making a choice. And if you do truly embrace the Jomo philosophy, the joy of missing out, of course you're not gonna do the two other things. Mm. You know, just because you're makes good, at, I mean, this is this is a problem, and it's particularly a problem uh, that we run into with our Stanford students. Is they're they're pretty smart, and they can pretty much do lots of different things, and so nothing does jump out at them as the job charming. Or in in, in another way, I look at it, it's like, well, I sucked at this, I sucked at this, and I sucked at this. So the only thing I can do is be a project manager at a you know the big company. Um, they mm. have that problem, um, and most people can do more than they think, and so. Uh, we lo I love uh, Professor Chang's framing. It's like you author your life and what you stand for when, when choices are on a par. There is no pro-con list that one rises to the uh, b b bigger than the other. Um, that's, 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 the, that's the magic moment when you decide, oh, I like living in cities. I like working on teams. And I'm going to optimize, you know, around a certain set of my skills. Not everything. I'm, 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 and I can do the other stuff. As a side hustle, as a hobby, as a thing I do, you know, in my community for service, because mm. the other thing that that we know from the research, particularly the grant study, the longest longitudinal study of adult human development is the thing that makes people happy and the thing that makes them live longer and the thing that makes them report their life as meaningful is relationships, love service to others particularly service to some service to something other than yourself and 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 gosh every you know that's a that's a, a piece of research that comes out of the psychology world but every wisdom tradition on the planet says the secret to a happy life is compassion amazing so, uh, well there's a there's a there's a big deal there's a there's a philosophical even theological concept called the scandal of particularity and the scandal of particularity means is it turns out we observe and people from a wide variety of, you know, you know, spiritual and philosophical and humanitarian mindsets concur on this observation that, you know, um, the universal is not directly accessible, only the particular. And it turns out that the universal is found through the, the, the focusing lens of the particular. You know, you, you, you can't grok, you know, the entire creation and divinity, but you can have your mind blown out by that sunset or that sleeping child. And as a human being who's bigger than themselves, you can't have it all. You literally can't have it all. And there's so much wrong with that job. Of course there is. The point isn't that. The point is that there's a thing called realness. The machine shop 
um, where we help people learn how to make things, we still make physical things every now and then, not just digital things at Stanford. And the machine shop is called the Product Realization Lab. And I've always wished they had hyphens, real hyphen I hyphenization. We realify things. What Dr. Chang's talking about, what Bill's talking about is, you know, as designers, we're makers, we're really into the real. You know, Bill used to run a, a design project for his design students on called, you know, called, you know, illuminating objects. We call them lights. Um, and they would design a light. Light design is a really cool thing. And I remember I used to sit in on that class when they would do their presentations. They'd walk around and see all these really cool things. And every now and then Bill would look at one and go, oh, that lamp is finished. Hmm. He would recognize the quality that it had, whatever that lamp was trying to be, had now become real. The designer had actually realified the concept sufficiently clearly that its realness was evident. Guess what? That real lamp was nothing like the one next to it. That mm. one next to it's trying to do something with illumination that this real lamp can't do. You can't do it all. The experience of life is to enjoy the fullness of realization in a particular space and time. When they wouldn't let me work on advanced energy technology and solve the energy crisis in 1973, like I was certified to do, <laughs> but I did accidentally walk through an open manhole cover and fall into Apple and could work for Steve Jobs and develop a thing called the mouse and laser printing, which I didn't want to do, but was happening. It was actually happening. There was a particular moment I felt like, let's go do something. Yeah. It's a lot more interesting to do something than to long for nothing. I think that's that's a great point. Well, I think that's a great place to wrap this one up. Where where can people follow you or uh, get get the book? Um, yeah, where where can people find it? Well, buy the book from a local bookseller, please. Not to you know, just because we want to support them. And, and around here, it's you know, it's uh, Kepler's and and um, City Lights and things like that. But um, you can get us at uh, designingyour.life. That's the website for us, for the book, for uh, and for lots of stories on there. People who've read the book and done something with their lives, some inspirational stuff and other things that you can find for resources. And, and all of the worksheets and all the you know, little assignments at the end of every chapter in the try stuff section, they're up, up on the website for free. Awesome. Well, if you want to hear us talk more, we read the audio book. Um, if you want to watch us talk more, you can go to creativelive.com, creativelive.com. 22 modules, eight hours of material. Come on down. You can <laughs> get buried with these guys. You know. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Take care. Yeah.